When you see John Kerry and Tim Waltz saying, well, this First Amendment, we're not really sure that we should have it. We think the First Amendment actually is a great hindrance to us stopping misinformation or disinformation, which is, of course, them saying it's stopping us to actually being able to control all of the narratives and stopping the flow of information we don't agree with. Join the best in the movement. It's conservative conversations with ISI, educating for liberty since 1953. Welcome back. You're listening to Conservative Conversations with Marlo Slayback and Tom Saruf. Today, we're joined by Ned Ryan, who's founder and CEO of American Majority and Voter Gravity, as well as the author of a few books, including the recently published American Leviathan, The Birth of the Administrative State and Progressive Authoritarianism. Thanks for joining us, Ned. Yeah, no, great to be with you. So I'm sure some of our listeners, if you've been uh, listening to conservative conversations for a while, you've probably heard an episode or two in there about uh, kind of tackling the administrative state from different angles. And, you know, today we'll be talking uh, to Ned specifically about his book. But for those of you who are novices um, or perhaps haven't listened to those episodes or like a refresher, um, Ned, could you just start us off with maybe mapping out for listeners the advent of the administrative state? and perhaps what the most notable flashpoints were in its development and growth um, in the late 19th century and 20th century. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's something that really originated, I would argue, turn of the 20th century uh, with the progressive, the rise of the progressive movement who were heavily inspired by Georg Hegel, who I refuse to call a Prussian philosopher. He's a Prussian propagandist. He was actually in the pay of Friedrich Wilhelm III to basically extol the beauties and the greatness of the authoritarian uh, monarchy of the Prussian state. And Georg Hegel uh, taught that the state was the march of God on earth, that objective truth, science, everything flowed from the state. The state was salvation. The state was a living organism that subsumed everything. And the reason that that thinking was brought back to our shores was during the late 1800s, we did not have the same university or college system in America that we have today. To get an advanced degree, you had to go over to France or Prussia. If you went to Prussia, the state-run university systems were heavily influenced by Hegel's thinking. And so Woodrow Wilson and a lot of these other founding progressives were influenced and brought this thinking back and thought this was the real solution to America's challenges in the 20th century, leave behind the antiquated thoughts of a constitutional republic with its separation of powers, which they believe would hinder progress, and instead, in its place, uh, wanted to put in a massive, sprawling bureaucracy, the administrative state, filled with an educated elite that they believe through applied science would lead to a greater, brighter future for society and culture, and literally to the perfection of mankind. They believed in the apotheosis of mankind, which is the deification of mankind, and that the state was salvation. And when you look at a real pivot point in American history, it's the presidential election of 1912, in which these ideas were openly discussed, embraced by most of the electorate, and with Woodrow Wilson's victory in his two terms, he began the administrative state. And then you look through the 20th century, obviously there's a little bit of a pause in the regime change, which really is what this is. The administrative state, with, with its undermining of the Constitution, progressives, the whole idea of the progressive movement was to destroy the political and moral authority of the Constitution and to destroy the machinery of the republic, which I think is an important point I want to make here. The machinery of the republic is the separation of powers. It's the diffusion of power, because our founders didn't trust human nature. They didn't think that imperfect humans should be trusted with consolidated power, thus the diffusion, the the separate branches in the federal government, but the idea of federalism. Progressives rejected that wholesale. They, They thought that was a bug, not a feature. They wanted to consolidate all of that power, the executive, legislative, and judicial, into the administrative state, give these unelected bureaucrats this this amazing power to, again, in their minds, guide society to a higher plane of, of an elevation for mankind. So that was the first wave, uh, regime change. The second wave was FDR and his New Deal. And then the third sledgehammer, progressive uh, statism, was LBJ's great, great society. And after those three massive sledgehammers to our constitutional republic, it, it became one of those things where I think Congress abdicated its role. Uh, the late 60s, early 70s, in regards to legislating and to actually doing the governing, and really unconstitutionally subdelegated a lot of the legislative authority to the Article II branch, where most of the administrative state resides, and let these unelected bureaucrats do most of the governing through their statutes and regulations. So when I talk administrative state, is this massive, sprawling bureaucracy that, quite frankly, guys, we don't even have a specific figure that is agreed upon 
in the federal government, is it 440 departments and agencies? Is it 443, 444? We don't really know, and yet we continue to blindly fund this and accept the legitimacy of it, uh, which is, again, in the eyes of permanent D.C., the great sin of Donald J. Trump is that he rejected the premise that this was legitimate. Hey there, listener. I wanted to take a quick moment to thank you for listening to Conservative Conversations. This podcast is a production of the Intercollegiate Studies Institute, and our mission here at ISI is Educating for Liberty. If you'd like to join us in fulfilling our mission, consider helping us by rating and reviewing this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you listen to help us reach more listeners like yourself. Now, back to the show. Yeah, and on that point, um, there seems to be, or at least when I was reading your book, one of the main themes is that this regime change, as you put it, there's a chasm in the perception of maybe the majority of Americans who are yes. dissatisfied, clearly. Uh, I mean, the approval rating of Congress is 8%, and you know, the Supreme Court is 27%. But there's this like chasm in the perception of how the government is designed, operates, and works, or at least is supposed to work, and but, how yeah. it works in practice. And so we say, or we see it and say, well, the government's not working, there's corruption, or it's not working. Whereas, in fact, like it is working just in a way that makes us frustrated and angry and is not contrary, contrary to our interests and to the will of the people. Yes. So what I'm curious to hear from your own experience, at what point did the sort of political theory or constitutional theory 101 of separation of powers, checks and balances of federated republic, at what point did you personally realize that this is not how, in fact, things are working? And what do you point to to talk to other, when you talk to other people about what- When it, when it became clear- when it became clear to me. You, you, yeah, you and then when you're talking to other people, what, what sort of things do you point to to kind of dislodge uh, this? Well, I mean, perception? for example, I, I tell people, I think two Supreme Court decisions this summer should, should highlight to people the reality of what has been taking place in D.C. for decades. Uh, you know, the Chevron deference decision that the Supreme Court made this summer uh, Chevron deference had been in existence for 40 years in which judges were to defer to the unelected bureaucrat statutes and regulations. And again, unconstitutional because that undermines the idea of the, the third branch and independent judiciary, uh, deferring again to the unelected bureaucrats who are actually been unconstitutionally subdelegated legislative authority by the Article I branch. So that's been going on 40 years. And the Supreme Court this summer said, we're not doing this anymore. But I think the other one that was really interesting to me this summer, Chevron deference and in, in- did not write about this topic uh, in regards to the SEC tribunals, in which the Security and Exchange Commission tribunals, the Supreme Court this summer said those are unconstitutional. You cannot have these private administrative law tribunals, which a lot of departments and agencies have, that with the SEC tribunals, 90% of the time were ruling in favor of the SEC. And the Supreme Court this summer said, no, we're not going to do this. You can't have your administrative law tribunals. Uh, undermines an independent judiciary, which I would point out to people was a very important thing for our founders. Our founders wanted an independent judiciary because what they were experiencing in pre-revolutionary times was a British court system that they felt was rubber stamping the edicts of King George III, his ministers, and even parliament that they felt were taking away their rights. So the founders like, we want an independent judiciary that will act as a check on these other branches. So that's an important part of that decision this summer. And the other part was the Seventh Amendment. The Supreme Court this summer said, you know, when you have these private tribunals, you, you're annihilating the Seventh Amendment and a right to trial by jury. And when you look at really the foundations of progressive thinking that is imbued into the administrative state, there are a couple of things I want to point out. One, if you view the state as a, a living organism and as salvation, the, the, the idea is that the state subsumes corporations, individuals, individual rights, and it gives them back to individual entities or, or individuals if it deems it of benefit to the state. So rights are more a series of suggestions than sacrosanct and, and you know unalienable. So I point out to people the Bill of Rights is a lovely list of great enumerated rights. It's just words on a piece of paper. The greatest defender of our natural inherent rights is the machinery of the Republic. Because if power is diffused, it cannot be consolidated to destroy your rights, which when you see John Kerry and Tim Waltz saying, well, this First Amendment, we're not really sure that we should have it. We think the First Amendment actually is a great hindrance to us stopping misinformation or disinformation. 
which is, of course, them saying it's stopping us to actually being able to control all of the narratives and, and stopping the flow of information we don't agree with. So you look at some of these things and realize th this has been going on for decades. So I tell people, again, 1912, beginning of the administrative state, people ask, when did Congress you know, abdicate its role? Late 60s, early 70s. So I would make an argument that really the last 50 years, uh, we have been operating under, in reality, an administrative state and an illusion of a constitutional republic. So you mentioned some of the intellectual origins of administrative yep. theory earlier, like Hegel. Um, but someone who I think is under discussed, and it, it jogged my memory whenever you were saying, li thinking of the state as a living organism, um, is this exploration of Darwin and how he influenced yes. political thinking at the time. And you mentioned thinking of the state as a living organism. And can you talk about the application of Darwinian evolutionary uh, biology to politics, especially in Wilson's thought, and how yeah. that shaped his uh, views on administrative theory? And um, what does it, you know, what does that even mean? And how did how did these Darwinian arguments even enter this perspective? So a lot of these progressives were absolutely adherents to Darwinian evolution. Uh, the one who really that I highlighted his beliefs in that Theodore Roosevelt. Uh, in, in the book, I discussed the four, the, the four horsemen of the progressive apocalypse, Woodrow Wilson, Herbert Crowley, Robert LaFollette, and, and Theodore Roosevelt. Theodore Roosevelt was an adherent to Darwinian evolution and believed, obviously, that, that things change, things are, are, are in a constant state of flux and, and perfection being achieved as we go through, through the course of history. Therefore, nothing's really static. We don't actually have to believe in some of these old antiquated ideas as we're advancing, as things are evolving. You look at what they, again, they believed as, as you're talking about Darwinian evolution and the whole idea of progress and, and going towards apotheosis of mankind. They believed, again, the state was a living organism. Therefore, to have a structured belief, again, the, the founders structured our constitutional republic off some very, very basic fundamental issues. Human nature and their belief in imperfect human beings in an imperfect world, that doesn't change. And again, when you talk about this whole idea of evolution, our founders believed that imperfect human beings in an imperfect world, capable of great good, incapable of sustained good, human times may change, but one thing remains the same. It's human nature. Okay? So, no, we are not evolving to a higher plane, which the progressives believe that that rational state, if we would just empower the rational state, we would achieve the end of history. We would achieve the apotheosis of mankind. So they viewed history as kind of this upward climb. And at the very end, was the rational state, perfection of mankind. Founders viewed it more like this, that history was more of a, this way, cyclical in nature because of human nature. Again, human nature is never going to be perfect. We keep on repeating the same mistakes. And so understanding human nature, it's not reaching a higher plane of perfection like the progressives believe. Acknowledging that, realizing we have these inherent God-given rights, we should never trust imperfect human nature with consolidated power. Therefore, based off that thinking, we're going to create a rights-based government. We hold these truths to be self-evident. All men are created equal. They are endowed by the creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men. The state does not give rights. The state does not take away rights. Government, the state, is meant to secure those rights, take none of them away. And so the founders were optimistic realists, and the progressives were utopian status. And a lot of their thinking, Hegel, Darwinian evolution tied into this idea of we have to get power to the state to achieve this evolution and perfection of mankind. They were strong adherents across the board to Hegel and Darwin. And it gets you to the point that I'll make, and then I'll let you guys ask me the question. I'll shut up. When you have unelected, unaccountable, consolidated power, it eventually ends up to being authoritarian. And that's exactly what they put in motion because the only separation progressives were interested in was separating out the administrative state from any political accountability. They thought politics was a corrupting influence. These pure, noble, educated elite, given this great power, surely they'd never abuse it. They're just going to lead us to a better, higher plane of, of civilization. So that's why I said in the, in the subtitle of the book, it's birthed in the administrative state and progressive authoritarianism because once you do that with un unelected, unaccountable, consolidated power, it eventually becomes authoritarian. So just to compare that with the founders thinking, um, that would be a more Newtonian understanding, correct? Of Right, that there are, there are laws of nature that are immutable. Yeah. Right, there are certain things, 
it is what it is, right? We're, we're in, again, in an imperfect world, there are things that are simply not going to change. And one of them, and I hate to break it to those listening, uh, as much as I would like to think that we will all somehow become much better people in this world, uh, I'm afraid there's something called, I, I believe in original sin, but I'll, I'll leave it to this, that we are imperfect human beings who will never be perfect. We'll be capable of moments of perfection in which we are capable of great good. We're incapable of sustained good. And oftentimes, a nasty part of human nature is we often do what we can, not what we should. And that was the beauty of what the founders did. They didn't even trust themselves. I mean, the point I want to make, they're sitting, they're sitting in Philadelphia, 1787. They know they're going to be the next presidents, vice presidents, representatives, senators, judges. Those men, if they were acting in their own self-interest, would have created a form of government that was essentially an oligarchy in which they had all the power. They didn't have to worry about diffusion of power or that anything, anything would slow down their, their ability to have that power. In fact, they did the opposite. And why did they do that? Why did they create this machinery of the Republican diffusion of power? Because they didn't trust themselves. And they knew that. And they knew no matter how much they wanted to be better people, they wanted the world to be a better place. Yeah, we're imperfect human beings in an imperfect world. Let's be realistic about it. We can be optimistic that we can create a form of government that's going to actually protect these rights and give us the greatest amount of freedom and, and liberty at the same time. We're never going to allow a situation where we give in to our worst impulses and then have the power to abuse others while we follow our worst impulses. On that point, and since you were mentioning Teddy Roosevelt, there's a, yeah. I think there's a resurgence in interest in Roosevelt amongst conservatives. Even so much, I'm reminded, we must, this was like two years ago now, we did an episode with F.H. Buckley on his book, Progressive Conservatism. Um, that championed in <laughs> Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, but you think about, if, if you think about the political priorities of today or some of the rethinking and realignment that's happened, yep. with, you know, Trump is maybe a, or Teddy Roosevelt's a forerunner in some ways to Trump's populism in terms of like conservation, trust busting. So now we talk about big tech oligarchs. Um, right. You know, Trump wants to save social security and keep the major entitlements, whereas maybe some of the other parts of the, Republican Party are interested in reassessing entitlements and talking about entitlement reform. Trump was the one saying during the primaries. But I'll, tell you, key, but I'll tell you a key difference. Yeah, what's the difference? Or why is Teddy Roosevelt, um, why is this maybe him as a model for twenty for early 21st century conservatism misguided in your view? Uh, because Donald Trump believes in representative democracy and Teddy Roosevelt didn't. And I mean that in all sincerity. You cannot have an unelected administrative state the people didn't elect it. The people have no recourse. There's no recourse for grievances against an unelected administrative state. In fact, commentators at the time said Roosevelt doesn't actually believe in democracy. He just believes in more government. And I, I mean this in all sincerity. I truly believe that Donald Trump, he, again, his great sin when he's elected January, uh, is inaugurated January of 2017. He comes to D.C. and essentially announces, I'm the duly elected president of the United States. Because of that, I decide a lot of domestic and foreign policy. And the administrative state and its allies in the Democratic Party, establishment Republicans and corporate propaganda said, we don't think so. So then became a question of, well, no, who decides who governs? Is it the duly elected representative of the American people or is it the unelected bureaucrats bolstered by its allies? And so Donald Trump believes that when you have elections, when you have truly representative democracy, that should actually bring a change in policy. But a lot of DC, and I've been here for almost 25 years, a lot of people in D.C. think that certain things have already been established in regards to, say, foreign policy. It doesn't matter what the elections say. It's already been decided. And Donald Trump showed up and said, well, actually, and, and the point I make to people all the time is he was not only a reaction to Obama. He was a reaction to George W. Bush and this whole idea of, of the neocon globalist nation building. At times, I call it warmongering, but but that whole mentality and then Obama and then you have Donald Trump, who's a rejection of both Obama and Bush because he believed that if there are real elections, there should be real policy changes based off who the American people have elected. And so that to me is one of the big differences between Donald Trump and Theodore Roosevelt. I don't think Roosevelt really truly believed in representative democracy and Donald Trump actually does. And it should have consequences. There should be change. So I want to make sure we're able to address um, a few other themes during this episode, including religion. So religion as a basis of American constitutionalism, specifically yep. 
So how has the transformation been influenced by religious ideas about God as the basis of human dignity and individual liberty? So again, it goes back to where do rights come from? And there can only be one giver of rights. And in the founders thinking, again, having studied the lives of the founders, you can say that they operated within a Judeo-Christian worldview. Did they actually adhere personally to a Christian faith system? Probably not when you deal with like a Benjamin Franklin or Thomas Jefferson, although they realize the importance of it. In that worldview, rights come from a creator, a transcendent creator. They do not come from the state. They do not come from any earthly power. What no earthly power gave, no earthly power can take away. And so it's the idea that there was a transcendent creator who gave rights. Their responsibility, the founders believed, their responsibility was to be good stewards of those rights. And how do you create a government that is a good steward of those rights given by a creator, ergo a rights-based government? Progressives rejected that entirely. Again, they, the, the state is the march of God on earth. The state is the decider of objective truth, really gives back those rights if it deems of benefit to the state. So the state is the giver of rights. And so progressives rejected that. So really, you know, kind of nice in theory, but we don't really believe that in the real world. For us to have progress, power should be consolidated. The state should be able to give rights or not give rights because they, they rejected the idea of a rights-based government because here's the problem in their mind. Let's say you have, what are we, 330 million, 340 million people in America right now. What if every last one of them was to make claims on their individual rights against the state and say, you can't do that. You're, you're infringing upon my rights. It's the proverbial monkey wrench into the machinery of progress. And so you can't have people making claims of inherent rights against the state to slow down progress. Therefore, the state's the one that decides. And even Theodore Roosevelt was very honest and open about this. He, he felt that you should only have private property if the state deemed it was a benefit to the state. Okay. So again, this whole idea of, of inherent rights, they thought would slow down progress, slow down the state. And again, also opposed to what the founders believed. I mean, James Madison wrote about this, and I always think this is one of the most interesting things that James Madison wrote, and he wrote a lot of interesting things. We have a right to property, and there's property and rights. And so the idea that we have a right to the physical things, we have a right to land and homes and all these things, but our rights are property, our right to freedom of speech, our freedom of conscience, all of these things are actual property rights that we are in many ways expected to defend and protect. And that's why when people... We talk about the American Revolution and people go, well, it's all based off the economic, again, progressive propaganda, by the way. But the founders believed that they had a moral obligation to defend the rights that had been given to them by their transcendent creator. And out of that belief, they fought the revolution. I call it the American Restoration. And then out of their experiences, created this rights-based government based off those fundamental beliefs. Well, if we're talking about economics, I'd love to hear you tell the story of how the 16th amendment comes about. Cause one of the things that's yeah. it's, if we're talking about individual yep. or limited government and the protection of individual personal liberty versus the, uh, totalitarian and impulse, uh, mar March of the progressive universal homogenous state, then yep. that's the di one difference would be the government has a very limited role to play in the taking of property and yet there is yeah. a taxation power and it's something that's recognized yes. as important even to the founders in the first congress so what is the um maybe you could explain how the apportionment pet part of the for article one in the constitution is changed and transformed as part of this larger project of a progressive american leviathan well so i will say this if i ever run for office and that's a massive question mark one of my main planks will be doing away with the private property tax, because I think it calls into question the whole idea of, again, going back to, we have a right to property. And if you have a property tax, I think it calls into question whether private property actually exists. But understand what the, what the progressives did. They realized that what was funding the government at the time, uh, tariffs and, and very, very minimal taxes randomly here and there, but it was mainly tariffs, did not give them the ability to fund this massive bureaucracy that they envisioned. And so for that to take place, you have to come up with a progressive income tax and you have to start widening the revenue base to actually fund the administrative state. Again, you, you need to fund salvation. Again, pe so I've been in D.C. again, 25 years. People ask, why does government continue to grow in D.C.? It, it seems perpetual. 
Well, I'm like, that's the DNA of the administrative state. It's perpetual growth. Because why would you ever want to limit salvation? If the state is salvation, salvation should be perpetual until it invades every aspect of your life and brings salvation to every aspect of your life. But for salvation to be funded, you have to widen the revenue base. And so they envision a progressive income tax, and out of that came the IRS. And Robert LaFollette even said he viewed the IRS and the income tax as a way to bring about a redistribution of wealth for economic and social justice. So they had a reason for that. So when we look at what's going on today and just this massive tax burden and the, the 16th Amendment that brought all of this about, they had to do it to fund the administrative state. So I was kind of interesting. I saw Trump talking about his tariffs and some of these things a couple days ago on X, and he didn't quite connect the dots between why we now have this massive tax burden and the whole way that government used to be funded. But when you had a government funded by tariffs, and again, we can have that debate as to whether the right approach is on that, but it, it literally, it limited government. It limited it in its size and it limited in its scope, which progressives found deeply limiting and resented it. And we're, that was one of the reasons they wanted to go after. And there's, there's four amendments that I call progressive amendments, 16th, 17th, 18th, and 19th. And, and the 16th is absolutely one of the things progressives wanted to bring about. So this is particularly germane given we have, I mean, as of the time of this recording, we have an election coming up in a few matter of few weeks. Yep. And um, it's pretty evident, you know, public trust has uh, totally tanked in our institutions, basically every <laughs> American institution except the U.S. military and small businesses um, right. is very low across the board. So Congress, 8 percent, uh, Supreme Court and the presidency at 27 percent, 26 percent, respectively. What would you say is why do people continue going along with the progressive ruling class? Um, I don't think they, they don't understand what's going on. I mean, and, and the reason the reason that there's such low approval is because so many of the American people have lost trust in government because they do not think that a, go that a government in theory that was supposed to be of, by, and for the people actually even thinks about the American people. I mean, again, one of Donald Trump's radical ideas with America First is that somehow the American people should be first and last in all things, trade, immigration, domestic, and foreign policy. I can tell you with great confidence, having been around this town for a long time, if the American people are even considered, it is an afterthought. And so you see those poll numbers reflecting the fact the American people have realized this isn't working for us. We're, we're an afterthought. We're, we're kind of the ruling class's ATM. They're going to soak us for cash to fund their priorities and throw us the crumbs afterwards. I think they've gone along with it because they do not know how DC works. I mean, this is one of the reasons I wanted to write this book and say, I want to have a little moment of illumination and clarity. Hopefully enough Amer of the American people will read it to go, oh, I knew something was wrong. I couldn't figure out what was wrong. And I hope the book actually gives them that moment of clarity and going, yeah, that, that's not how a constitutional republic is supposed to work. And again, I would remind people a fundamental definition of the republic, all power flows from the people. And power flows from the people to their duly elected representatives, who they make the stewards of the power and money given to them to create a government that is of, by, and for the people that every day is supposed to promote and protect the interests of the American people. And I would ask you this, in what aspect of our government today do you actually think any of that is true on any level, whether domestic or foreign policy? None at all. And so that, again, Donald Trump shows up and people go, this, this kind of... I, some people think he's crass. I think he's hilarious. This crass Manhattan billionaire shows up. How on earth is he the champion of, of the working class and all the of, of a lot of the American people of the Republican Party? It's because he's realized he's tapped into this angst that the American people feel that we're funding this government that is abusing us, is treating us as an afterthought, is treating us as an ATM, as our lives are getting worse under it. So, again, they've accepted the premise because they don't know. Uh, they don't understand the reality of it. And I think once they awaken to it, I mean, this is the this this would be the beginning of the end for the administrative state. There's three things. One, the administrative state resides in the executive branch. The head of the executive branch is the duly elected president of the United States. When you have a president that has the moral and political courage to actually devolve the administrative state, say Donald J. Trump, who has a much better idea of how things work now in D.C. than he did the first time around, comes into power. I think that's the beginning. Supreme Court stepping up, cracks in the foundation of the administrative state with the Chevron deference and the SEC decision. 
But I think the biggest one is the American people rejecting the premise that the administrative state is legitimate or constitutional in any way. But you can't reject it until you know what's actually going on. But once the American people awaken, because I think a lot of them have been asleep in the light, once they awaken and realize that, it's the beginning of the end for the administrative state. Well, I think this book is a great primer. Uh, it's yeah. not very long. And it's written in sort exactly. of a conversational way. And it's written in a way that, you know, anyone with basically, you know, you don't need a PhD or you don't need to be one of these bureaucratic credentialed experts to understand yep. what's going on. But you and can I did, I did that for a reason. Yeah, I did it for a reason. I didn't want to make it terribly long. And I wanted to make it very approachable uh, in very, a very narrative form for people to be able to read through it quickly, understand it and go, ah, wait a minute. I think I now understand, have a much better understanding of what's going on. And I've had people that have already come back and read and gone, hmm, that was, that, that nailed it. Yep. That's a great, and, and I do view it as a conversation starter. I really do. And if you want more, you know, detailed information on the progressive administrative state, there's some great works by other people. This is the beginning point for people to understand. Oh, now I know what the problem is. Yeah. And, and I think the last chapter in particular is particularly yeah. fantastic because it gives some solutions or yep. different things tools in the tool belt of uh, a, a, an incoming administration that a wants a, a, a powerful right. executive. Exactly. So what the, I wrote them all down as you, as I was reading through, I won't read them all, but how about you tell us about them? So I'll, I'll tell you about a few and then you have to get the book to read them. Uh, but you know, so again, the administrative state resides inside the article two executive branch, the head of it, duly elected president. Donald Trump comes into office January of 2025. He's got to get a couple things right. Well, first of all, he's got to get transition personnel. When he wins, I'm, you know, I'm fairly optimistic. Nothing's a done deal, even though I feel optimistic he's going to win on November 5th. He wins. Uh, transition personnel has to be done right. Uh, again, the great outsider didn't fully understand all the different dynamics the first time around. This time he does. He's got to get transition personnel right, and he's got to get the office of presidential personnel right. PPO. PPO is one of those the most important roles in any administration that most people don't know about that you have to nail. You've got to get it correct. And then inside the PPO, a lot of decisions, not all, but a lot of them are made in regards to the plum book, which depending on the administration is four to 5,000 political appointees that every administration gets from secretaries all the way down to Sched C, Schedule C's, which are low-level political appointments. And I'd say there's about four or 500 important decision makers that need to be done right in the next administration. So considering that Congress will probably be gutless wonders, uh, again, in four years, the head of the executive branch can do a lot of things like RIFs, reduction in force exercises. There's 800,000 federal employees that are considered non-essential. I think that's a great starting point. Um, I mentioned some other things where Again, we remember the whole Ukrainian quid pro quo. Uh, I call him Chow Thief Venman from the NSC. White House PPO was not over, is not over NSC personnel decisions. NSC personnel decisions need to be made by the White House Office of Presidential Personnel. Uh, reclassifying some of these powerful bureaucrats into Schedule F, which would make them uh, accountable and therefore fireable. Um, you know, do, doing away with some of the stuff that takes place. I, I would actually argue in the book that OPM, Office of uh, Personnel Management, should be a cabinet position to highlight the importance of that role inside of the administration. And so just go through a whole series of things that a powerful executive can do, even if Congress will not step up to the plate, which would be nice if they did. Because I've told Trump this, you know, the foundation of the swamp is the state. If you break the state, you'll drain the swamp, you restore the republic. But It'd be nice if Congress actually stepped up with the purse strings, as you mentioned earlier, starve the beast. But Congress, I, I think Congress has found this very comfortable existence over the last 50 years, and I'll tell you why. They have subdelegated a lot of their legislative authority to the unelected bureaucrats in the Article II branch. They passed these four or 5,000 page bills that are really frameworks for what they kind of maybe think should happen. Send it over to those bureaucrats who, with their statutes and regulations, put a fine point on it. And through that, do the actual governing. So then the bureaucrats are the ones having to make those uncomfortable decisions that the voters back in the district might not like. So when these guys go back 
to the district to go, it wasn't my decision. I didn't do that. It was some official at the FDA or the EPA or whatever, whatever department and agency. I'm going to go back to CEC. If you give me another two years or six years, I'm going to go back. I'm going to fight them. I'm going to, I'm going to fight for you, and I'm going to try and undo this. While they go back and they pass four or 5,000-page bills to give the unelected bureaucrats the power to legislate uh, as they continue to blindly fund them. And so it'd be nice if Congress actually stepped up to the plate. But the reason that a lot of them won't is that most members of Congress, and there's some good people, don't get me wrong. I don't want to make 100% of them, you know, blanket statement, but most of them are experts in self-preservation. So the fact that they get to duck hard decisions and they can blindly fund these bureaucrats to do the real governing allows them to duck the hard decisions that might endanger them being reelected. So Congress is actually going to have to step up and legislate and govern and I hope that the Supreme Court, with decisions like Chevron deference, continue to force Congress to actually step up to the plate. In the meantime, powerful executive starts to dismantle the state for four years. I think you go. We can make a lot of steps in the right direction. That makes sense, and that's a, those are a few helpful things, and the rest can be found yes, in American in the last chapter. <laughs> um, But I got. I think a, it's a two-part last question for you. Um, yep. Is you know, as a strong executive is going to potentially do all of these things, it will inevitably be the case that the other branches or the other parts of in the administrative state will resist and put throw out trying to throw out roadblocks. Um, of course they will. The media or uh, you know more impeachments or you know yes. name your tool because there are all sorts of for one tool there is some sort of counterplay to try and thwart um, some of these things. Maybe not in all cases, but. Um, so remember, there will be, go ahead. Yeah, no, I, I know you got one more, but I, but I want to make this point. <clears throat> head of the executive branch, administrative state inside the executive branch, unified theory, the head of the executive branch, the administrative state inside the executive branch answers to the duly elected president of the United States. And so one of the other things I mentioned in the last chapter is in-person visits to the various departments and agencies. One of the favorite, favorite tactics of these bureaucrats, elections come and go, administrations come and go, the state remains, and they mm -hmm. know that. So they slow play all these things. Oh, you know, I'll look at that email in a couple of weeks or, oh, I must have missed that in my inbox. Or they'll, they'll look at some of these policy initiatives from the administration and go, hmm, let's see how we can get this stuck in committee meetings inside. And then six months later, nothing's happened. A year later, nothing's happened. And so in-person visits by the executive calling those bureaucrats onto the carpet and saying, why haven't you done this? Oh, you're not going to do it. I'm going to fire you immediately here on the spot. I would love for that to happen as one of these reform items to take it to the Supreme Court. Let's have that conversation in front of this Supreme Court. I like our odds. I like our odds on that. Well, then maybe I'll just turn to the second part of my question, which is a much, I think, a much bigger question of, are the people ready for the restoration of Republican self-government? Because what kind of what you were mentioning with congressional leaders, they benefit from the system as it currently they do. exists. So they do. this would be a lot more responsibility on them, which is something we've talked yes, about asked before <laughs> and on the people uh in the respective states state legislatures and local communities right. to actually do the business of governing and so this sort of art of republican liberty have it yep. been lost it's much easier to lose something than to build it back up it uh, is and so what are your what's your prognosis if you're a betting man for the likelihood of or how ready we are for this sort of um so, you know, re restore our Republican self-government. And then maybe I guess the second part to that question would be what should, what can each of us do? What can the listeners do to make ourselves ready if we're not? I'll read the book. Uh, but but I would say, I mean, one of the things that I think is very important is, is. So a couple things, the American people, this would put a lot of responsibility back into what is self-government look like? And it's not the idea of the American people's governing themselves by giving their duly elected representative power and money and holding them accountable. It's the idea of actually self-governing each individual. I make that point in my first book, Restoring Our Republic, that a self-governing republic is based off self-governing people, based off a common set of ideals and principles. So when I say those things, I'm fully aware we are very far away from having a common set of ideals and principles and values by which society governs itself. Um, my, my solution in the short term is, it, my solution in the short term, you gain political power and you use it and you hold on to political power for 12 years to reshape government to then get people accustomed to new behavioral patterns. And so people ask me all the time, can you get a lot done in four years? Is it enough? 
No, it's not enough. You can get a lot done. You're going to need at least 12 years of America first type president in the White House with hopefully Congress stepping up to start to break apart the state, to return value, to, to return responsibilities back to the various branches, to return the idea of federalism back. I think it's going to be all out political war for 12 years to readjust people's perceptions on how government is supposed to work before they then again realize oh yeah, we do have a responsibility to actually be engaged and involved a lot more. We have a responsibility to hold our elected officials to accountability because they are now doing the actual governing. So it's not a short-term process. I'm fully aware of that. I mean, we didn't get here overnight. I mean, it took us 110 years to get to where we are today. And you don't get out of that overnight. And so I want people to go, and I write this in the last page. It sounds simple, break the state, drain the swamp, restore the republic. It's monumental in application. And I'm fully aware of that. I'm fully aware for us to, to restore the republic is not overnight, but we, gain, we first do it by gaining and achieving political power and then using political power. I have to tell you, Republicans are terrible at that idea. This is one of my pet peeves with the Republican Party. They are given political power by the American people, and then they do not use political power like it should be used. Democrats, progressives get it. And they gain that political power, and they're like, by God, we've been given this political power. We are going to reshape society and culture into an image of our own making. The Republicans are like, we're going to kind of trim around the edges and be careerists. At some point, it would be nice if Republicans understood we were given political power for a reason. Let's use it properly. And I think Donald Trump knows that, and he knows if he is given political power again, he will use it very well the next time around. Well, I guess we'll find out. But uh, yeah. Ned, this has been uh, a lot of fun. The book, again, American Leviathan, which has a beautiful cover. Uh, I love the octopus. Thank you. Um, very apt political it, cartoon. It was one of the, what, the, the design was kind of my idea. There was another one the publisher had in mind, and then it didn't work. Somebody else had already done it. I said, can you just have the American flag, which represents the republic, being torn down by Leviathan? Because I think that really encapsulates where we are today. And I said, sure. Well, I we recommend the book. Um, Thank you. It's very easy to read in even one sitting. But um, if uh, people want to find out more of your work, um, maybe your first book or other things, or keep up yep. to date with what you're doing, what should they look for? Where should they follow you? So the first book was Restoring Our Republic, and it really discusses uh, the, the constructing the machinery of the republic, the, the Constitutional Convention, and then how our founders constructed it, what they intended, and how we started to drift away from it. My second book was really kind of a passion project, The Adversaries, A Story of Boston and Bunker Hill, about one of my heroes, Dr. Joseph Warren. And then obviously, American Leviathan. You can get them at Amazon.com. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter, at Ned Ryan. It's N-E-D-R-Y-U-N. I have way too much fun. It's actually X now. I still call it Twitter. And AmericanMajority.org. Uh, I'm, I'm the founder and CEO of that organization. We do a lot of good things, training people, equipping them how to bring about change in their, their local uh, communities and states. And then American Majority Action, our C4, we are heavily involved at this moment in four key battleground states with absentee ballot chase and early voting projects. And by significant, I mean pretty significant. We'll have about 1,600 people doing this work over the last four weeks uh, in, in really trying to achieve political power in hopes that that political power will be used to dismantle and devolve the administrative state. Well, excellent. Thanks, Ned. All right. I appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Thank you for listening to Conservative Conversations with ISI. If you've enjoyed this episode, be sure to check out our website at isi.org slash resources to see all that we offer our members, including the Intercollegiate Review, select Modern Age articles, debates, lectures, and of course, this podcast. Thanks again for listening. Don't forget to rate and review, and we will see you next time on Conservative Conversations with ISI.